In my last lecture, I described to you the central supermassive black hole that resides at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And then using the orbital parameters of one of the stars in orbit around that black hole, we then use those orbital parameters to calculate the black hole's mass. As I mentioned briefly at the end of that video, ultimately the central supermassive black hole of the Milky Way, as impressive as it is, is actually a relative pipsqueak compared to some of the other central supermassive black holes associated with some other galaxies. So let me now take the opportunity to introduce you to perhaps the single most massive object that we know of that is relatively nearby. In order to do so, however, I have to first of all give you perhaps the ultimate example of what is referred to as a you are here map. Are you guys familiar with such a map? It usually shows your location in relation to other things around you. So let me go, you, go ahead and show you the ultimate you are here map to introduce to you this single most massive object that we know of that is still relatively nearby. Okay, so you are here. Okay, first of all, of course, we do have the Milky Way galaxy. As we've described, it's an example of a barred spiral galaxy like so. It roughly looks like a pinwheel, like this. And then right here, for example, is the location in red of the sun, about two-thirds of the way out from the galactic center. Now, close to the Milky Way galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy has several smaller satellite galaxies. These are actually the most common types of galaxies that are present in the universe. They are much smaller than the Milky Way, and they have an amorphous shape associated with them. These types of galaxies are referred to as dwarf irregular galaxies. Typically, dwarf irregular galaxies contain upwards of several million stars. So scattered around the Milky Way like so are a couple of these dwarf irregular galaxies like this. Now, two of these dwarf irregular galaxies are actually rather famous. They are called the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. Unfortunately, you're never going to be able to see either of those dwarf irregular galaxies from Los Angeles. And the reason for that is because they are both, just by chance, rather close to the south celestial pole. So you basically have to be south of the equator in order to see them. One of the first Europeans to document their existence was the explorer Ferdinand Magellan. That's ultimately why they are named after him. They are called the Magellanic Clouds. I myself have seen the Magellanic Clouds from the couple of vacations that I have taken south of the equator. The large Magellanic Cloud is actually quite large in the sky. It's about as large as your fist held out at arm's length in the sky, but once again, unfortunately, you're never gonna be able to see it from here in Los Angeles because just by chance, it's rather close to the South Celestial Pole. Same thing with the small Magellanic Cloud, which is about half the size of the large Magellanic Cloud. The two clouds, by the way, are referred to as the LMC and the SMC. The LMC is about 150,000 light years or so away from Earth, and the SMC is a little bit further. Okay, now, about two and a half million light years away from the Milky Way galaxy is our next nearest big neighbor. This is the Andromeda galaxy. Like so. The Andromeda galaxy is another spiral galaxy similar to the Milky Way, and it's kind of tipped on its side. It's viewed obliquely from our angle here at our location on the Earth at the location of the Sun. The distance between us and the Andromeda galaxy is, is, as I said, about two and a half million light years. The Andromeda galaxy is visible to the naked eye from here in the Northern Hemisphere, but you definitely have to be away from city lights and light pollution in order to be able to see it. It's about the size of the full moon in the sky, but it is certainly a lot dimmer. You have to be very far away from city lights in order to be able to see it. It is, by the way, the furthest object from us that you can see with the naked eye at two and a half million light years. And when you look at that object, due to the finite speed of light, you're looking two and a half million years into the past. It takes two and a half million years for the light to go from that galaxy to your eye, so then therefore you are seeing that galaxy as it appeared two and a half million years ago. When you look out into the universe due to the finite speed of light, you are looking back into the past. 
So for example, when you look at the moon, it takes light about one, moon, one second rather to go from the moon to your eye. So then therefore, when you look at the moon, you're looking one second into the past. It takes about eight minutes or so for light to go from the sun to your eye. So then therefore, when you look at the sun, you're looking eight minutes into the past. So if the sun was to blow up right now, don't worry, it's not going to, but if the sun was to blow up right now, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes because of the finite speed of light. So when you look out into the universe, you are looking back into the past. If you can see the Andromeda galaxy with the naked eye, you're looking two and a half million years into the past. You're looking at light that literally predates the human species. Okay, now relatively close to Andromeda, but a little bit further away from us, like so, is another smaller spiral galaxy. It's about half the size of the Milky Way. It's about half the size of Andromeda, and this is referred to as triangulum. Each of these spiral galaxies, by the way, have their own small family of dwarf regular galaxies, like so, as does the Milky Way. So what I've drawn here on the board thus far is about two dozen or so galaxies dominated by these three spirals. This is our local galaxy cluster. Our local galaxy cluster here is called the local group. Okay, now the local group, it turns out, is actually part of a much larger conglomeration of galaxies that's referred to as the Virgo supercluster. The Virgo supercluster is a collection of several thousand galaxies and is roughly in the direction of the constellation of Virgo. That's why it's referred to as the Virgo supercluster. The Milky Way and the local group as a whole is kind of on the outskirts of the Virgo supercluster. So the Virgo supercluster is a collection of several thousand galaxies and the local group is kind of on the outskirts okay the shape of the Virgo supercluster is roughly like a balloon sort of shape and contained within that volume are several thousand galaxies. It kind of roughly looks kind of something like this, like so. So now take the local group on the top board, for example, take this entire diagram and then basically fit it into here, like so. That's roughly where the local group is located here in relation to the main supercluster. So then therefore, within the Milky Way galaxy, right here, for example, we'll say, is the location of the sun. And then when you look in the direction of the constellation of Virgo from our vantage point here on the surface of the Earth, we then see this large collection of several thousand galaxies and we're on the outskirts of it. Okay, now right near the center of the Virgo supercluster lies a gargantuan giant elliptical galaxy that's referred to as M87. M87 is a giant elliptical galaxy. So it's not a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. It's basically a huge ball of stars. M87 is truly gigantic. The amount of stars that are contained within this galaxy is in the neighborhood of several trillion. So it is a lot larger than the Milky Way. The Milky Way, for example, contains several hundred billion stars. We believe that giant elliptical galaxies form from the collision of spiral galaxies. When spiral galaxies collide together, Ultimately, they gravitationally disrupt each other. When this happens, ultimately, there is a huge amount of star formation that takes place in a relatively short period of time. But then after that star formation takes place, because the spiral structure of the galaxies is basically disrupted, eventually over time, star formation begins to shut down. So after several billion years of this process of galaxy collision ongoing, you basically end up then with a huge ball of stars and very little star formation taking place. That's what we believe happened in the past to this galaxy M87. We think that M87 resulted from the collision of spiral galaxies. This process, by the way, will happen to the Milky Way. The Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda, they're actually heading towards each other right now with a relative speed of about 75 kilometers per second. 
Starting about 5 billion years or so from now, those two galaxies will begin to collide. And then eventually after the collision takes place over the course of a billion years or so, then ultimately we'll end up with a giant elliptical galaxy that is the result of the collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda. Ultimately, the central supermassive black holes of those galaxies will merge together at the center. That's what has happened to M87. The distance from the sun to M87, by the way, is about 50 million light years. Okay, now at the center of M87 lies a truly gargantuan supermassive black hole. The Milky Way's central supermassive black hole is actually pretty quiet. It's more or less just sitting there and you have a bunch of stars in orbit around it as we described in the previous problem. Every now and then a star will pass by close to the Milky Way's black hole. Every now and then a cloud of gas will eventually fall into the black hole. When this happens, basically the Milky Way's black hole more or less burps, if you will, as it dines on a small meal. Well, not so in the case of M87. M87's black hole right now is dining on an enormous meal. It is dining on a huge amount of material that is flowing down the drain of this black hole. When a huge amount of material flows down the drain of a supermassive black hole, such as M87's, Ultimately, all sorts of interesting physics occurs. Here's the basic structure of what happens around a supermassive black hole when it's dining on a huge amount of material. Okay, so let's say right here is the black hole itself. And then as material begins to go down the drain of the black hole, much like water, for example, flowing down the drain in your bathtub, it kind of flattens out like so. This material that is flattened out is basically racing around the black hole at an enormous speed, and then ultimately there's a huge amount of friction that takes place between that material. This then means that a huge amount of energy is radiated away from this point. The amount of energy that's pouring out of this relatively small volume is by far much greater than can any be, or rather than ener any energy that could be produced, for example, by ordinary stars. We see a huge amount of energy pouring out of this very small region around M87's black hole. The disk of material that forms as it races around the black hole while spiral spiraling down the drain is referred to as an accretion disk. Okay, and then much further out from the accretion disk is an enormous donut or torus of material that is in orbit around the black hole. This torus of material that's in orbit around M87's black hole is mind-bogglingly big. It is 120 light years wide. To give you an idea as to how big that is, the distance from the sun to our nearest stellar neighbor, the triple star system Alpha Centauri, is about 4.3 light years. This donut of material that's around M87's black hole is 120 light years wide. That is absolutely mind-boggling as to how big that is. It's even stranger than that, however, there are two enormous jets of radiation, like so, that are being blasted out of the poles of the black hole. And ultimately that's due to all of the magnetic fields that are present here getting twisted up and ultimately accelerating material to extremely high speeds. So you end up with these huge jets of radiation that are pouring out of the pole of the black hole itself. Now, this sounds a little strange. How can material be blasted away from the black hole? Ultimately, shouldn't everything just fall down the drain? Well, here's a nice analogy that astrophysicists like to use. It's like trying to fill a dog dish with a fire hose. If you fill a dog dish with a fire hose, most of the water is gonna get blasted out of the dish. It's kind of the same idea here. You have a huge amount of material that's trying to be crammed into an extremely small space. Most of that material, quite frankly, doesn't make it. So ultimately, you end up with these huge, ultra high energy jets of radiation that are being blasted out of the poles of the black hole.
The amount of energy that's pouring out of M87's black hole in this manner is mind-bogglingly large. The length of these ultra high energy jets of radiation that are pouring out of the black hole are actually longer than the Milky Way is wide. Just to give you an idea as to how much energy that is present in this situation. So ultimately when you have a central supermassive black hole like M87 that's extremely active, you then ultimately end up with all this weird interesting physics that occurs immediately surrounding it. This is not happening right now to the Milky Way's black hole. Okay, now before I get to a problem associated with this black hole, what I want you to do right now is pause this lecture and then go ahead and watch the screencast called The Local Group and Beyond. I take you through this ultimate you are here map and I show you a lot of photographs of these objects as we go. So go ahead and watch that screencast now. It is presented to you as an Ed Puzzle. Okay, now that you've watched that screencast, let's go ahead then and turn some of the information about M87's black hole here into a problem. And then ultimately the numbers that you'll see in this problem, those are numbers that are measured. So let's go ahead and read the problem. I give you some information about M87 in the problem and it also says that gas has been observed orbiting the black hole at a speed of 780 kilometers per second at a distance of 60 light years from the black hole estimate the black hole's mass in terms of solar masses. So here's what we're given. We have this huge torus or donut of material in orbit around the black hole. The black hole here has a mass that we'll call M hole. This distance right here is what's given to us R as 60 light years. Notice that the orbital period of the material right here, we'll call it mass M, is not given to us. Instead, the speed of the material is given to us as it orbits the black hole. Measuring the speed of this material is actually really easy to do due to something called the Doppler effect. Here's how it works in this context of light. So for example, let's say that this right here are the two sides of the torus, here and here. And then from our vantage point, we'll say this material here is moving towards us like so, and then this material here is moving away from us like so. Well, with the material that is moving towards you, it emits light as it does. The light that it emits, however, its wavelength is shortened a little bit. It's shifted towards the blue portion of the spectrum. This is referred to as a blue shift. The material that is over here that is moving away from us like so, while the light that it emits towards us is stretched out a little bit, its wavelength is shifted towards the red portion of the spectrum. And this is referred to as a red shift. The amount of redshift and the amount of blue shift could be used to measure the relative speed of the material as it orbits the black hole. So the speed of this material right here is given to us, it's measured in this manner, it's equal to 780 kilometers per second. Once again, let me give you an idea as to exactly how much gravity is present here. For example, as the Earth orbits the Sun, it does so in one year and our orbital speed relative to the sun is 30 kilometers per second. Our distance from the sun is one astronomical unit. This material is 60 light years away from the black hole, and it's moving at an orbital speed of 780 kilometers per second. That's mind boggling as to exactly how big this black hole is. So let's use this information right here to calculate the mass of the black hole. I'm gonna do this problem from scratch, however, because this is not quite a Kepler's third law problem. Instead of given the period, we're given instead the orbital speed. So let me set up the problem like this. I'm just gonna use a little bit of F equals MA. So there's one force exerted on this material, and that's the force of gravity associated with this black hole. This then causes a centripetal acceleration inwards towards the center of the diagram. And now we'll go ahead and write F equals MA in the following way. Okay, so we first of all have the force of gravity exerted upon the material. So that's capital G times the mass of the black hole times the mass of the material itself divided by distance squared. This then equals mass times acceleration, where it's once again the centripetal acceleration. And then from this setup, the usual things cancel. The mass of the material cancels out, as does one of the distances r like so. And now all that we have to do is cross multiply here and just solve for the mass of the black hole. Nothing more than that. 
So the mass of the black hole then ends up being V squared times R, like so, and then divided by capital G. But once again, everything has to be in the right units. So first of all, the distance R, which was 60 light years. Let me go ahead and convert this into meters. So 9.46 times 10 to the 15th meters per light year. Light years cancels out, and we end up with a distance here in terms of meters. So let's see, 60 times uh, 9.46 times 10 to the 15th. And this works out to be about 5.68 or so times 10 to the 17th meters. Okay, and then the speed V, which was 780 kilometers per second, we do have to convert this into meters per second. So just multiply by 1,000 meters per kilometer. This is 780 times 10 to the third meters per second. And now we just plug everything in, all, as well as big G, and we then calculate the mass of the black hole here in terms of kilograms. Okay, so I still have small r here in my calculator, so let's now multiply by 780 times 10 to the third squared, and then divide by g. Okay, so punching all of that out, this comes out to be about 5.2 or so times 10 to the 39 kilograms. So you can see immediately that it's bigger, considerably bigger, bigger than the central supermassive black hole of the Milky Way. If I, if I now divide out by the mass of the sun, two times 10 to the 30th kilograms, there we go. I then end up now with the mass of this black hole in terms of solar masses. It's about 2.6 or so times 10 to the ninth solar masses. But 10 to the ninth is a billion. So we're talking about two and a half billion solar masses, give or take. How big is this in relation to the mass of the central supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way? Well, that was in the neighborhood of three and a half million solar masses. This is about a thousand times bigger. So this central supermassive black hole to the galaxy M87, where all of this interesting, bizarre physics is taking place, is the single most massive object that we know of that is still relatively nearby. Once again, make sure that you watch all the screencasts that I've posted for you associated with these topics.